And then once we emote, she's going to count down and she's going to snap a photo of us. You can do your thumbs up. You can do the wavy, wavy. Um, you want to join us, Alana? You're welcome to come with us, too. There we go. Um, awesome. And everybody, nobody's blocking anybody else. Let me get out of everybody's way. Okay. And, what, okay. Uh, and we're going to start emoting. Um, yep. Go ahead and start emoting. Start. And Donna's going to count us down. Donna? Yeah. Can you hear me? Everybody smile. Barely. Yes. Uh, <laughs> okay. And three, two. Okay, I got it. She got yes. it. Okay. Thank now, you. thank you so much. Now I'm gonna kick you all off the stage. So <laughs> <laughs> it may, it may be. I'm gonna. It may be abrupt. Okay. There we go. All right, and it's all yours, Craig. Okay. Here. okay, please stand next to me. Let me see. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Let me just see if. Uh... Hello, everyone. Let me just turn and see. Dieter, if you can get all set up over there, that would be great. So, two wonderful students of mine. Uh, these students are from Singapore, and they teach, or I, we, I teach there. We're at an international school in a lovely tropical Singapore. And so we've, over the last couple of years, been exposed to VR. Some students, uh, like Lucas over here, is going to talk about our VR clubs that we run and what he's learned. So he's up second. And then we have Dieter, who's up first, and he's going to talk about a study that he for, he performed in VR. So I am going to, without further ado, let Dieter talk to us about his study that he did in VR. Awesome, thank you. I'm excited. Virtual reality has always been praised for its ability to immerse immerse people in a world that is entirely different than their present. Through the power of a VR headset, one can expose themselves to the dystopias and utopias of their imagination. And this, which is, I think, the fantasy of the entertainment industry, allows individuals to explore the very borders of their dreams. And while this is an extremely enticing use for virtual reality, I also think VR has another extremely um, interesting potential. And that is, rather than exposing ourselves or immersing ourselves in environments that are entirely different than the present, ones that are impossible to create in reality, I think VR has this amazing potential to um, allow ourselves to augment the reality that we live in right now. And it is under that guise that I want, want to introduce my presentation titled Virtual Reality is a Cure for Acrophobia, or the Fear of Height. Um, so what did I do? Essentially, I conducted an investigation into the potential of virtual reality, and this comes kind of in two folds. Number one, it was a proof of concept study looking at virtual reality as a therapeutic technique for the fear of heights. The second regard that I wanted to look at was an investigation into the technical barriers of virtual reality and the extent to which it is accessible for individuals in domains outside of the technical industry. So before I get in, into explaining my project, I want to start with a few key takeaways. Number one is kind of this notion that virtual reality is a tool. Um, we can look at this from the, the microcosm, the smaller world of just my specific study, looking at kind of therapeutic techniques for phobias or the medical industry as a whole, and we see this, this notion that virtual reality, or that there is no cure to anything, but rather virtual reality is a tool. Just like a, a doctor might utilize medicines to treat a patient's condition, I think that virtual reality has this amazing potential to become a therapeutic technique, to become another tool in the toolbox of medical professionals around the world. Right. And later in this presentation, I want to expand that from sort of that microcosm of just my study and generalize it to the macrocosm of all these different industries in the world where utilizing virtual reality um, can be a very powerful tool in order to allow us to augment the very reality that we live in and kind of surpass some of the limitations that we see with different elements of research and different elements of medicine. Right. The other aspect, which I think is kind of a prerequisite to this first notion, is the, bar the technical barriers of virtual reality. And it's this idea that if we want virtual reality to become mainstream, if we want it to be adopted as a technique for research, 
but a technique for medicine, we have to lower the technical barrier. And so I talk about that through programs like Modbox and other elements. So without further ado, let's look at my project specifically. What I did was I investigated one simple question. To what extent can virtual reality serve as a therapy for phobias? Um, and I was inspired to, to investigate this from an advertisement campaign that Samsung had done looking at the very same topic. But my problem was is that Samsung approached this from the perspective of advertising the potential of VR, saying, look at the Samsung Gear VR headset, this is what you can do with it. Amazing, as because it demonstrates the very same conclusion that I think I'm going to come to, I wanted to investigate this from a psychological perspective and investigate this from the perspective that is simply asking the question whether or not virtual reality can be a therapeutic technique for phobias. And so to start, I spoke to a psychologist named Brent McDonald, and I asked him, how do we treat phobias in real life? And he answered me with two, with a two-part response. The first part about the way that we define phobias, because the technical definition of a phobia is simply an emotional response to a particular stimulus. But this, this, this definition is extremely problematic because it doesn't actually narrow down our scope all that much. Um, for instance, I think that any normal person when standing on the edge of a 100-foot cliff will experience an emotional response to that stimulus. It's kind of in our human nature to feel like that. And so that's where um, Mr. McDonald suggested that we have to go in a level of abstraction deeper. Instead of looking at it as a pure definition, as an emotional response to stimulus, what we can instead look at is our reaction to that emotional response. So in this sense, we can make a distinction between people who are just experiencing normal human emotions and people who are actually experiencing a phobia. So if someone who has a fear of heights is standing on the edge of the cliff, sure, they're also going to experience this emotional response, but the difference is that they're going to react to this emotional response fairly irrationally. And this irrational response to emotion will likely incapacitate them and not allow them to function as a normal human being when exposed to the stimulus. And this is where the second part of Mr. McDonald's response comes in. Looking at it from that perspective, that definition changes the very way that we are going to approach treating a phobia. Rather than trying to eliminate the emotional response altogether, because every single human being experiences that, we can try to change the way that individuals react to this emotional response, thereby effectively treating their phobia. Because if they can function normally, if they can behave normally when facing this emotional response, all of a sudden we can generally say they're not experiencing this phobia anymore. And so, as a proof of concept, I wanted to look into exactly that. Mr. McDonald introduced this idea as this concept of exposure therapy. And the idea is pretty simple. All you have to do to overcome this, this phobia, or, or one of the techniques that people use to overcome phobias, is they expose people to their phobia in a safe and controlled environment over a period of time, allowing them to build a sort of a tolerance or build up confidence to this emotional response and learn how to function normally. The problem is, Exposure therapy is really difficult to do in reality for a number of reasons. For instance, let's say that you have a fear of heights and you want to expose yourself to the fear of heights. Well, first of all, you have to find a situation that you can put yourself in where you're at the top of a building, where you're experiencing a real height. And so that scene is an interruption to one's day-to-day -day life and often makes it difficult to have effective exposure therapy. The second aspect that you have to consider is this idea that there's an element of danger involved. And particularly with how fragile people who experience phobias can be around their phobia or around whatever they're afraid of, um, you have to consider that if something were to go wrong during this real life exposure therapy, all of a sudden, all of the progress that you've made will be completely eliminated. And that's where I thought virtual reality might come in. Can we use VR as sort of a bypass, a way to create this exposure therapy, allow individuals to be treated like this without actually exposing them to any sort of real danger or without even interrupting their day-to-day -day routines because they can engage in this exposure therapy from the comfort of their living room. And so therefore, I designed a proof of concept study where we expose patients who um, talk about their who experience a fear of heights to heights in virtual reality consistently over a period of time, and then measure how their response to that emotional, uh, their, their, their response to that changes. Essentially what I did was I created three rooms that I put patients through consecutively over the course of a few days, and I measured how their response to their fear of heights changed through it being coming exposed to these heights in this room. The first room was set in a dust bowl and it featured heights of about 10 minutes. I allowed patients to go into this room for about 5 or 10 minutes and explore it at their own pace. That way they could become comfortable with the environment and sort of experience it as they go. 
the second room was at an amount of and it featured heights of about 15 meters. Now, diving back into this idea of technicality that I'll talk about a lot later in this presentation, these first two rooms are created in Modbox. They use Unity, I didn't use Unreal Engine, I simply used the program Modbox, which is a sandbox tool that allowed me to drag and drop assets and visually manipulate the environment in order to create the world that I desire. And I think this is really important because if we think about a, a person in the medical industry or a researcher, they're not necessarily going to have access to the development team in order to create these bespoke experiences that they desire. And so programs like Modlock are extremely important in that regard, and if we want first reality to be adopted in the mainstream. The third room that I utilized took advantage of Richie's clinic experience. It um, featured heights, skyscraper heights, but importantly, it allowed us to use a real-life plank that was matched to the plank virtually in the game to augment that the, sort of the aspect of realism because the patients, whatever they were feeling underneath their feet was exactly what they were seeing in the real world. This, however, brings up an important limitation in terms of the technicality of VR because it would have been extremely difficult for me to emulate that blank, real life plank in Modbox. And so I was lucky enough to be able to use a consumer ready application which is plank experience. But again, if we're thinking of researchers or medical professionals creating bespoke experiences for their patients, that's not something everyone is always going to have access to, and it could be a limiting factor if you want virtual reality to be adopted mainstream. So I collected data in this study in two key mechanisms. First of all, was this qualitative mechanism of heart rate measurement. Now, heart rate is a very interesting uh, way to measure a physiological response to fear because when you are exposed to emotion from the stimuli in the way that we defined um, the phobias earlier, what we ultimately see is that there is a spike in a heart rate. And so by tracking heart rate, we can, we can track the extent to which they're experiencing a physiological response to fear. More importantly, however, I also took a qualitative assessment of their personal feelings about fear and their personal way that they react to this. And I think that's significantly more important because, again, we're not trying to eliminate the emotional response to a particular stimulus or a particular phobia, but rather we're trying to change the way that they behave and function and react around the stimulus. And so by taking a qualitative assessment of how they felt, we were able to get a better, um, just a better idea into kind of the way the effectiveness of this technique for treating phobias. The results of the study ultimately supported the idea that virtual reality could be functioned as a form of exposure therapy. In terms of the qualitative data, we did see a steady decline in average and maximum heart rate over the course of the, uh, the duration of the testing. More importantly, however, we saw through the qualitative assessment that in the patients demonstrated an increased level of comfort over time. I know one patient, for instance, at the very beginning of the trials, couldn't even get to the edge of the 10 meter room. They were so afraid of heights and they were so incapacitated by that fear. But by the very end of it, they were able to actually step out onto the plank and feel comfortable in this environment surrounded by fear. And so again, it supports this idea of exposure therapy, suggesting that by exposing someone to their fears, whether it be in real life or as the study demonstrates in virtual reality, they're able to make an impact on response to that emotional stimulus and therefore hopefully allow them to function better when exposed to these fears. I think I'd be reminiscent if I didn't bring up some limitations with this study before I got into some conclusions. First of all, by no means is this a comprehensive research study. Rather, what I want this study to demonstrate is sort of a proof of concept, suggesting the idea that there's potential for virtual reality to serve as a therapeutic technique, but not necessarily saying that it's a cure for virtual reality. Um, is that a question, Frank? Okay, yeah, continue. Um, and so I think that, first of all, there's sort of this, the, the, there's some restraints with the nature of the study. For instance, it was a small, convenient sample, meaning that I actually knew all the participants personally, and that will come in later in a second. But then what was the short duration of the trials? And finally, there was sort of a loose control of the variable. I didn't want to interrupt the patient's lifestyle. I didn't necessarily control things that might have a response to fear, such as food intake, medicine intake, or even alcohol intake. The other thing that I think is important to mention is because of the fact that the participants were, had a personal relationship with me, the researcher, and they were aware of the aim of the study, there is a potential that the man characteristics played a role here, suggesting that maybe the conclusions, um, uh, suggesting that the participants might be liable to the Hawthorne effect, where they are simply behaving in a way where they're aware of, aware of it or not in order to um, push a particular conclusion. Regardless, what is important is that to this day, I know that the patients, because I have a personal relationship with patients, I know that all of them have stated that they feel significantly more comfortable around their heights after experiencing this exposure therapy in VR, which is a really interesting conclusion. So, what does this all mean for virtual reality? Well, I think 
think it suggests this really important notion that VR is an extremely powerful tool. We can look at this from sort of, again, as I mentioned earlier, the microcosm of medical industry, the microcosm of my study, suggesting that maybe it's not pure, but it's certainly therapeutic. And it's a tool that doctors should be taking advantage of because of its convenience, because of its accessibility for individuals, especially at a time like right now when people don't necessarily have access to the ability to go out and experience the fear of heights. Secondly, however, and very importantly, I think that we can expand this sort of study, this sort of proof of concept to the, micro, the macrocosm of research in the industry entire, in the industry entirely. Because what we see is that one of the biggest limitations of research right now is money. Right? People don't necessarily have enough funding in order to conduct the studies that they want. For instance, if someone wanted to conduct this study in real life just to test the efficacy of exposure therapy, they would have had to find patients, potentially pay the patients in order to make them um, watch the study. And then they also need to find, as uh, limitations that I mentioned earlier, a place to go up, a place where they can experience this fear of heights. Virtual reality bypasses all of these limitations by allowing individuals to experience exposure therapy from the comfort of their own home, from the comfort of a classroom, or even from a laboratory. The other thing that's really interesting to look at that VR, that VR kind of overcomes is this sort of I think, this sort of debate that people have when designing studies. I know in psychology, there's kind of an important decision that researchers have to make between lab and field experiments because they conduct a laboratory experiment. They can claim causation between variable X and variable Y because the variables can be controlled tightly. There's not very many confounding variables that are going to influence the results of the study. However, when conducting lab experiments in virtual reality, it's extremely difficult to generalize those results beyond the conditions of the lab because of the fact that the laboratory doesn't necessarily emulate real life. Right? So then on the other hand, researchers also have the choice of selecting a field experiment where they're conducting the experiment and conducting the research in a real-world environment. However, this is also difficult because now you don't necessarily have tight control over your variables. And you can't claim causation between variable X and variable Y. It puts researchers in an extremely difficult situation, and specifically for psychology. It's part of the reason that we haven't actually discovered a lot about psychology in the past. However, I think that virtual reality can overcome this because it allows to create environments with significantly high ecological validity because we can kind of create bespoke and custom tailored experiences for the real, for the emulate the real world in this virtual environment. But it also maintains significantly high control over our variables because at the end of the day, it's a virtual environment. And we can do things such as control and make sure the room is set exactly the same every single time, potentially allowing us to um, claim causation between variable X and variable Y. Furthermore, um, and so, so kind of it ultimately suggests this notion that I think is really important, which is that as virtual reality becomes more mainstream, it's important to consider its uses beyond just the entertainment industry. And I think that as everyone in this conference is aware, virtual reality has so much potential for things like education, for things like research, and in this case, for things like the medical industry, that it's super important to consider how we can use virtual reality and then tailor our development of virtual reality so that it supports this. And that's something that I found very prevalent in the study when I'm mixing note on technicality. So this study was conducted in a manner that required extremely little, te little technical knowledge. It felt first to create created in Modbox, which is kind of an experience that you can visually create environments. I don't necessarily need to have any specific technical knowledge in order to um, work with that, in order to work with that program. And then the third program uh, was a custom, or was a, a consumer-ready product, which is plant experience, which again, didn't necessarily require technical knowledge to do. And this is very important because if we want virtual reality to be adopted mainstream, it has to be accessible. The technical barrier has to be low because the researchers, the doctors, and the educators that we want to be using virtual reality don't necessarily have access to a team of developers to create custom bespoke experiences for them. Rather, what we need to do is we need to continue working on tools like Modbox, like Altscape, where people can create environments and interact and almost create these custom bespoke experiences for the research or for the education or for the medical industry without necessarily having high technical knowledge. And that's extremely important. So I think that virtual reality is an extremely powerful tool and I think we've come a long way just in the last 10 years in allowing it to take and allowing it to be a tool for the medical industry, for the education industry. And I really hope that as virtual reality develops further that we can continue along this line and make it an extremely powerful tool for everyone to use. Does anyone have any questions?
Hasan. Thank you, Dieter. That was an uh, excellent sort of overview of your study that you did. Uh, very impressed at your polished speaking skills. I had a few comments already on Twitter about that. Um, one more last call. Anybody I uh, can open up the post panel? Just, I was going to try and open up the question panel, but that's not my forte. So I think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get Lucas set up then next if... Uh... Awesome, thank you guys so much. Amazing, this is amazing. <laughs> so while we're waiting for Lucas to get set up, Lucas, as I said, he's a grade 11 student, and he's been instrumental for us Hello. in setting up, our, uh, setting up our high school virtual reality clubs at the school. We're going to listen to him talk about that. Are you ready, Lucas? Yep. All right. Take it away, Lucas. Right. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Lucas and today I'll be presenting about how VR can be used as a tool to enhance student learning. So first of all, I would just like to delve into the hardware side of VR uh, stuff. So basically, starting off at the entry level, you have the Google Cardboard and the Samsung Gear VR, those type of uh, devices that utilize the smartphone as the main VR hardware device. and these are usually really limited to only experiential games where you move around and explore with limited basic controls and feature sets. However, from my experience at my school, uh, we have around 10 to 20 of these devices, and these are usually, usually typically good for uh, large classes of students to experience VR for the first time. Moving up to the mid-tier, you have the Oculus Quest and the newly released HTC Vive Cosmos. Now these, app, uh, these VR headsets are usually your main general use headsets that are able to run most VR applications with an acceptable interactive and, and feature set with its uh, really great controllers. And I'm using one right now. And at my school, we have around five of the HTC, uh, the Oculus Quest. And these are usually targeted towards general users, gamers, and even the educational sector. And from my experience, most students that have interacted with the Quest uh, have given me positive feedback in regards to the resolution and as well as the controller feedback that they get from using them. And of course, moving on to the top of the line, you have like the HTC Vive Pro and the Valve Index. Uh, now these devices pack in the industry's top of the line specs uh, from highest refresh rate displays and highest resolution as well as really innovative uh, controllers, and at my school we have one HTC Vive Pro. And from my experience, um, there's really no significant difference between the mid-tier and the top-of-the-line headsets, as you will occasionally notice the resolution and refresh rate smoothness in the HTC Vive Pro. But ultimately, for general educational application and games, I would say the mid-tier is good enough for it. Uh, moving on to the software side of things, I have divided uh, applications into three categories in terms of complexity. So for the standard end, um, these are usually experiential applications with a one-way interaction where the users will uh, walk around in the VR world and maybe interact with some items in the, in the world. Uh, and an example of this is NatureTrex VR, where it offers you around set six to seven different scenes from the uh, bottom of the ocean in the earth to all the way to space. And these are really good exploration-based games for young kids or even new VR players to get their toes dipped into the waters of the VR world. Moving on to the advanced tier, um, these are usually your main task-based applications 
where the game will give the user a task and they'll actually have to complete the task in the VR world. And it gives a two-way experience. And it offers more interactivity and complexity. So these are more uh, applicable to people who want to actually interact with the VR world. And an example of this is Jobs in the VR. It's basically a really fun game where it gives you a mundane office jobs you do in real life, but they simplify to just a few buttons and it gives the users the creative freedom to do however the tasks they were given to finish it. And uh, lastly, it's the, it's the complex to your games. Now these are usually sandbox based applications where the users dictate the entire experience and these offer full interactivity and immersive experience with heavy emphasis on critical thinking. For example, uh, the tier, they, they offer an entire tool set with building blocks and even certain gadgets for the users to interact with in the world uh, it, it, with, a, with a simple marble. So even a simple object can be transformed through the user's imagination in sandbox type games. So my point I would like to make today is that VR can enhance student engagement and motivation. And in these following slides, I will explain how I came to this conclusion. So one of my first experience in VR at school was through my own student-led computing club. And it was during the middle of our, one of our units where uh, I was teaching them game development. And I actually coordinated with my teacher to set up a VR session. And, and the main purpose was, of this was to give the students uh, ideas and inspiration for what games could be like, especially in VR. And I gave them ex uh, experience from the standard all the way to the complex level. And the feedback I received from them was that they said simplicity is usually more fun and easy to follow rather than the complex sandboxes games. As they said, it overwhelmed them with uh, too much options. So I think what they're trying to say to me was that they, they, they rather prefer games where they uh, teach you and lead you through the game with simplistic controls rather than the game just dumping you in a sandbox game with no instructions and telling you to do whatever you want. Furthermore, um, I'm also part of the VR club in my school, and it's basically a small experiential group focused on VR experiences and educational testing games. So each week, uh, our teacher will give us different games and headsets to try out. And sometimes we will even try out alpha development build games, which I'll get into more later. And the main purpose of this club was to provide feedback, advice, and ex experience from us as students to the school and as well as developers that have reached out to us. And one of the community and service activities that I did was on the B-Well day in my school. And this day is basically a normal school day, but instead of having classes, they changed the curriculum to having uh, several mindfulness activity stations on that day where students can sign up. And on this day, I hosted a, a VR mindfulness uh, session and various students from across the age group from grade two to all the way to seniors would sign up and I let them try out NatureTrex VR and Google Earth VR as most of them were UVs and from what I can see, many of the students were really immersed and engaged with the experience that I provided them. For example, this little girl here, she's in second grade. Uh, when she put on the headset for the first time and she experienced the deep blue ocean in Nature Trek's VR, she was absolutely blown away and stunned. And I, and personally, I feel like this made me really happy and excited as I touched a young potential student that she may grow up to experience more VR applications in the future. And moving on to my personal experience with, with different types of VR games, starting off with puzzle games. Um, two notable ones that I'd like to mention are Shadowpoint and Gadget Gear. Uh, Shadowpoint is basically a story-driven VR game, a VR puzzle game, which is narrated by Patrick Stewart. Um, now this game not only immerses you with its stunning visuals, but also with the soothing narrative voice from Patrick Stewart, as it <laughs> really guides you through like a story-based adventure but at the same time, you need to use your entire world in 360 in order to complete puzzles which they give you. So it really 
uh, induces the critical thinking in me when I experienced it. And this can also be extended to gadgeteer, as I mentioned before, where it gives you several challenges to move the marble from the starting position all the way to the other end with an obstacle in between. And they only give you a set number of materials or blocks that you can use. So it took me quite a while to complete some of the higher end challenges. And overall, I feel like puzzle games are a great addition for students to try out in VR. Furthermore, uh, there's, there's also creation tools in VR, um, such as Tilt Brush and Modbox. Uh, Tilt Brush is basically a 3D painting app, but it's in VR. So when I tried it for the first time, it was really a dimensionally changing thinking for me, as I was used to you know, painting 2D on a canvas with my painting brush. But in Tilt Brush, I found myself constantly moving around, trying to see how my artwork looked in different perspectives. And Modbox, of course, as Dieter mentioned previously, is basically like a sandbox building application similar to Gary's Mod, if some of you may know that game. And basically, it just offers the student and user the creative freedom to do whatever they want. And I think and one of the most important features I like about it is that you can not only create your own environment, but you, but you can also share it with other people as well. So you can see how, uh, for example, your peer made this cool looking house compared to your looking skateboard arena and overall it, it induces the creative thinking within students and moving on to cooperative games one one of my favorite ones is called Acron and it's basically a mixed reality game so basically one one player will be playing as a tree in VR and the rest of the players which will be playing squirrels and it could have up to eight to ten players as a squirrel it will be playing through the mobile devices. And the goal of the game is to steal the acorns right in front of the tree and take it back to the burrow. And this game really, it, it really needs good teamwork as the first few times I played with my friends, we, we were not communicating at all. So we got absolutely destroyed by the tree. But after we got used to it, made some actual strategies and tactics, like for example, directing, oh, you go to the left flank, I go to the right flank. Um, we managed to have success of the game and honestly this is a great team building a team building and team bonding game as it, it not only requires everyone to need a headset but everyone is included as they can just use the mobile devices and finally um, I have also experienced with alpha development games for example uh, new tree VR uh, a new tree is basically a mathematics based VR game which allows you to visualize 3d geometry in VR so personally, I struggle with understanding some of the more complex um, mathematical concepts with uh, equations. And Neutri really helped me understand and have that idea click into my brain as you can manipulate the geometric structures in VR in real time and move around and see how it could um, influence the equations you do with the different variables that you change. And this uh, and, and the developer Neotree actually reached out to my school and my teacher, and my teacher actually uh, provided us a early development sample to play around. And one of the few issues we made uh, found was that the GUI was small sometimes, so we sent that feedback off to the developer, and ultimately we we made this game a better experience for everybody to use. So my hope is that more and more opportunities for VR should be incorporated into school learning. As if this does be, become incorporated, it can not only make learning more fun, but also more immersive and engaging for not only the students, but also the teachers as well. As, as currently, even in my school, I feel like uh, there's a severe limitation in terms of accessibility to students, as only students can access the VR devices in the VR club. So I hope that more and more schools and teachers will implement this into the actual curriculum. And as you all know, in the current global situation, digital learning is the new norm. So this is a potential for VR to be used to actually enhance the learning rather than, rather than for students spending most of their time in the, in the screen, sitting at the desk, uh, going in a Google Meet or Zoom hangout with the teachers. And also VR opens up learning outside of school. For example, myself, I've been dabbling into Unreal Engine 4 VR development just early stages, but this shows how VR can be used outside school as well. 
And overall, I feel like VR, uh, this is just the beginning of VR, and there's more to come in, in the future. Thank you. If there's any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, thank you, Lucas. And we're going to get uh, Angelina to help us with questions. Uh, that's not my forte. I can do it. Ready? You can do it? Uh -huh. So, so if any put the raise hand button, and then I'll field your questions, and you guys can answer them. So if anybody has a question, you can hit the raise hand button down at your right. Serenity has a question. Serenity, you have the megaphone. Hey, Lucas, yes. I just wanted to ask you, do you have a favorite kind of um, VR game or app that uh, you like using in your own time? Uh, yeah, um, I actually have several. One of my favorite ones is uh, Super Hot VR. It's basically like a time-based shooter where time only moves when you move. It's really cool where you just stand still and think out your decisions. And also, I like a Gadgeteer as the puzzle aspect of it is really intriguing to me uh, because I let, it, I let my younger sister use it and she really loves playing around with it, yeah. I'll ask a second question if that's all right. Uh, what do you yeah. feel you've learnt most uh, from yourself as a person? What do you think you've learnt most from VR? I think what I've learnt most in VR is that um, people can express themselves more freely in VR compared to the real mm -hmm. world as you don't have that social anxiety, I could say, because I'm an uh, introverted person and I feel like the VR aspect really helps me get over my social anxiety and be more sociable in the VR space. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Any more questions? Oh, a jar, whoops, went away. Any other questions? Whoops. I went inside the wall. Okay. I think. Uh, yes, Vincent, please go ahead. He's muted. Need to click the raise hand button on the bottom right, please, if you wanted to do a question. No, the, the raise hand on the bottom right, not in the wheel. Has he got it? Uh-uh. Oh, yep, there it goes. Okay. Bryson, you've got the megaphone. Go ahead, ask your question. Uh, sorry, I can't hear you. Can't hear. Try it again. No, he's got the megaphone. Oh, turned it off. Okay, we'll come back. To him. Uh, Serenity, do you have another question? Yeah, um, Dieter didn't get to ask any, any questions earlier. Dieter, are you on megaphone? Because uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, what do you feel the greatest success you had with your um, study? And can you mention also maybe one thing that didn't quite work? Um, I think one of the greatest successes for me was just looking at participant responses. Um, I know that one of the participants has Parkinson's, and so it's very hard for him to you know, go through day-to-day -day life already, and to be able to see him kind of cope with his fear of heights in a situation is really, really nice to see. Um, in terms of struggles, I found that it was... I found it 
difficult to a like because I was um I'll just a couple here. First of all, because I was had a personal relationship with other participants, I found it difficult to maintain sort of like a an academic tone in the way that I handle them, right? Because we know that if I'm doing any sort of research, you have to follow a very strict procedure and you have to go through step and step and step um, very consistently. And so it's difficult for me personally to deal with this convenient sample of participants that I know personally um, and to then go through and adapt a professional tone with them. And so I think that was one difficulty. And then I think another difficulty was also um, when I was using Modbox to create the rooms. Modbox is a very simple program to use, but I found it difficult for sort of a learning curve in terms of creating like experiences because it's very easy just to drop in a couple of assets and have it work. But with the whole modding community, and especially because this was a few years ago before Mod, I know Modbox has received some updates since then. But with um, trying to figure out what mods I wanted to use and how I wanted to do this and that, there was a, a significant learning curve on that end, and so. I think it's very hard to strike a balance between allowing users to have control and create these custom bespoke experiences, but then also make it simple and have a very low learning curve. And so, yeah. That sounds very good. Thank you. Okay. Hey. I don't see any other questions. If anybody has one, we've got. Ah, here we go. A jar. I'm going to give you the megaphone. Ajar, go ahead. Do you think there's any things that would be hard to do with VR? Um, I think right now, the uh, I don't I don't think there's anything that much hard you can do with VR because there's different applications for different stuff you can do. Could you be more specific about what, what do you mean by hard? Like, like, what do you mean by how hard it could be in VR? Uh, well, like, what about like the pricing of VR headsets? Oh, yes. Um, in regards to pricing, um, you still have the entry level devices such as Google Cardboard and the Samsung Gear VR. Those are still available for those consumers with low budget, but I think there's a big gap between mid-tier and entry-level devices. So yes, I do agree that that is one of the challenges in VR in terms of getting people access to the VR headsets that have controllers and actual good hardware to run multiple applications. Okay. I think that, sorry, I'm interrupt. I think that um, from like this perspective, another difficulty that might come in is just implementing interactions. And so I think that the visual end of VR is actually very, very good. If you look at high end prices of the Valve Index, it's very, very high, but integrating the way that we actually interact with the VR environment is really difficult because controllers aren't necessarily the most organic way to manipulate with an environment. And so kind of, I think that as we want to make things, it, it's very difficult to have um, people interact with virtual reality in like a realistic way, if that makes any sense. And so I think that kind of uh, developments such as I think the new uh, the new hand controllers from Valve, I think, and I know that there's actually some companies working on like haptic suits and things like that, and I think that will make kind of interacting with the environment a lot more realistic. Thank you. Good question. And I've got um, oh here we go, Bryson. Let's try again. Um, okay, you have the megaphone. Go ahead. You have the megaphone. You can go ahead and ask your question. Oh, turned it off. Let's try again. Go ahead, Bryson. Well, I think we'll have to wait until afterwards. He wanted to make you guys, he said he knows that VR is the way of the future. And both of you were so forward thinking that he was so impressed with that. And he was hoping that he could add you as his friend. Oh, thank you.
Thank you, Sean, no problem. And yeah. And that's yeah. Good. I think you all deserve a huge round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Don't, don't make me think. Okay, don't leave yet. <laughs> um, I just wanted to um, say that Craig and his students are really, really illustrate what we were going for in this conference where we have a really great mentor and really great students that kind of blur the lines between who's the student and who's the teacher. They gave such great, great information. They are students, but they're also teachers. I know I learned a lot as part of this experience, and I wanted to thank you. Um, you guys did a fantastic job, and if we hadn't introduced you as the students, we wouldn't have known that you were the students. We would have thought you were the teachers. And so th that comes from having really good people to help guide and to, uh, because the way that we're learning now is really about guiding our students to kind of take the lead. And so I really, a whole bunch of claps for everybody for, for, for that. And I wanted to let everybody know that we're going to be um, taking a break now and uh, for half an hour, but please join us because uh, the director of the American Indian Resource Center will be talking about putting headsets into 50 schools in, um, in Oklahoma and Cherokee Nation. But let's take a break and then come back and watch that keynote address followed by Kayla Jumper, um, who will be talking about her experience also in Native America. And so thank you guys so much. And uh, get out of headsets for a moment, rub your eyes, go eat something. And we'll be back. You guys did a fantastic job. Just amazing. Thank you guys so much. I'm going to unmute everybody. So if, if, oh, I think you already are. Are you unmuted? Is everybody yeah. unmuted? Yeah. Okay, great. So if you want to come and meet your pre the presenters in person and talk to them, you're welcome to do that. Or if you guys would like to go down. Excellent job. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Angelina. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Fantastic, awesome. guys. And if you, anybody wants to meet anybody else, um, I'm going to jump out a headset real fast, and I will catch up with you guys. Please come to the keynote, okay, guys? I can't wait for the headset I already Find the next event in the um, Alt Space yeah. VR calendar and go there, okay, guys? <laughs> All right, bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we can all hear now. Yeah. How do I you can all unmute. How do you leave? Are you stay are you wanting to stay in out space? Uh, yeah. or okay, would well, you hit your menu?